Hi, it's Dwyer, DigitalAssetLife.com, a free site, RichardDwyer.co. Let's talk crypto. Today is March the 22nd, 2021. But remember, nothing I say in this video should be construed as investment advice. I'm just offering things for entertainment value only. I'm just sharing my thoughts as well as my critique of an excellent crypto article I came across. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now there's an excellent debate on Real Vision. I encourage people to watch it, realvision.com. Let me also add that Real Vision is offering people access to their cryptocurrency videos free of cost. Um, I can hardly think of a better deal online. Well, the debate is on the pros and cons of Bitcoin, right? The Bitcoin skeptic is Mike Green. He's excellent. This video is really focused on his views, right? I'm a Bitcoin bull. I do try to get the other side of the argument. I believe Mike Green has done in this debate about as good a job as a Bitcoin critic can do, right? The other person in the debate was Anthony Pompliano. I'm a big fan of Pomp as he's known, right? But this video really concerns Michael Green's comments. Let's talk about them, they're thought provoking. <clears throat> Michael Green points out first that Bitcoin mining is concentrated in China. Now, just speaking uh, as an American, I know the United States' relationship with China is complicated, right? They're not the best of friends. What Mike Green is telling you that uh, is that Bitcoin is not decentralized, that there is a single country point of failure. That China, if they wanted to manipulate Bitcoin mining, and China has at least 80% of the mining market for Bitcoin. According to Mike Green, China can simply mine empty blocks and shut down the Bitcoin system for about $7 billion, which is a pittance when you're talking about a huge economy like China's economy, right? There's much more uncertainty here, given the fact that <clears throat> China holds a lot of cards in the Bitcoin ecosystem because of their mining dominance, right? There's a lot more uncertainty with Bitcoin than there is with gold which of course has been around for centuries, which of course really can't be manipulated the way China could conceivably manipulate Bitcoin mining. Now, of course, the counter to this is that the Bitcoin market is relatively new. It's about 12 years old. And that as it matures, more mining will take place outside of China. We're already seeing the emergence of miners like HUD-8, uh, Riot Blockchain, Hive, right? They're going to continue to spread out globally. But just understand, Mike Green does make an excellent point, and I'm a Bitcoin bull, that the concentration of mining in China right now does give China undue influence at least a potential for undue influence in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Green makes some other arguments. Let me also take a sidestep here too and point out that Bitcoin, of course, has the biggest hash rate in the cryptoverse. So you can imagine if there are concerns about the level of decentralization with Bitcoin, you can imagine how much greater those concerns are with some of the other cryptocurrencies who are proof of work that don't have Bitcoin's hash rate. Let's talk about some other points Mike 
Green has made. And I offer this as a Bitcoin bull. I believe Bitcoin is the best investment anyone can make right now. Right? I really believe this is one of those rare investment opportunities. Right? Um, but I also believe that people need to be up front in thinking about the risks inherent in their investments. Right? It might impact investment sizing for many. Another point Mike Green is making is that one of the parts of the Bitcoin narrative that Bitcoiners love to embrace is the idea that we don't know who created Bitcoin. Right? Chitosi Nakamoto might be a person, might be a group. They're unknown. The idea is that the technology belongs to the people. Right? It's almost biblical where you hear this is how Bitcoin was born. We don't know much about this group. It's kind of like technology's equivalent of the Virgin Mary. Right? This technology is therefore pure. It wasn't created by a corporation or a nation state, some sovereign entity. Well, Mike Green's point is a brilliant one. He points out, well, how do you know? If the origin is unclear, how do you know that Bitcoin wasn't created by a foreign country? How do you know that their goal wasn't nefarious? That some foreign entity didn't create Bitcoin with the goal of destabilizing the world's monetary systems. Right? Green says, hey, you need to ask yourself <clears throat> why countries like China are allowing Bitcoin to exist. Why they haven't completely shut down their mining capability. He's implying that Bitcoin might have a back door someplace that the creator might be able to tap into to everyone's detriment. Some back door that might be able to destabilize the technology. Right now, my counter to that is simply <clears throat> Bitcoin's been around for more than a decade. It's been studied heavily. Right? People have looked at the code. It's even spawned other cryptocurrencies. I believe that the chances of there being a backdoor are remote. As for some countries' goal in creating Bitcoin, if in fact the nation state created Bitcoin, who cares? Right? I believe the purpose behind its design doesn't obviate its use case. Bitcoin is popular because it's useful. Because it is a store of value. Because it has lower storage costs than gold. Because you can cross borders with just a catchphrase in your head that will allow you to pull up your Bitcoin holdings. Right? So maybe some country somewhere along the line <clears throat> had some diabolical plot to take over the world or to destabilize the world's money. I couldn't care less as long as the cryptography, which has been reviewed and reviewed and reviewed for years, is sound. Well, let's continue. <clears throat> Mike Green points out that Bitcoin exchanges such as Binance, one of the world's largest Bitcoin exchanges, are different than traditional stock exchanges, right? With Binance, you're trading with the house, right? I'm buying Bitcoin off of Binance. Now that's very different than the New York Stock Exchange where they're counterparties, where the exchange is just a meeting place, 
not an actual party to the transaction. Well, you know, that's true. Be aware of that risk. But I would argue that the maturation of the market will lead to more peer-to-peer -peer trading. Also, there will be market self-regulation because the exchanges, there are several of them, are competing with each other. <clears throat> right? You're going to have price and service discovery. You're going to have customers demanding certain protocols. So in time, I believe the exchanges will move closer to the New York Stock Exchange model to the extent that the exchanges continue to exist in the long term. <clears throat> Mike Green also makes the point that the Bitcoin market data is unreliable. Right? We're relying on private actors. The level of regulation in the Bitcoin space isn't what it is in legacy finance. So when you're hearing about transaction volumes, some of those volumes might be illusory. In fact, the volumes might be inflated by people who stand to profit from you believing that a coin you're buying is more popular than it is, is more in demand than it is, is used more than it is. Right? Mike Green also points out that the lack of reliable market data hides a lot of criminal activity. Right? It's true. It's true. That you can track some Bitcoin transactions. But what I believe is also true is that there are privacy-centered cryptocurrencies, right? Horizon, Monero, Pirate Chain, dApps, right? You have some privacy coins, Zcash, <clears throat> that don't leave a trail. That if you're going to engage in criminal activity, well, cryptocurrency gives you an opportunity to do so in an environment where the market data really hasn't been vetted and is unreliable. My comeback to that, Here's my, my comeback to that is who cares? So what? Right? I hear that drug traffickers use planes. That doesn't discredit plane travel. Right? Understand, to me, as long as cryptocurrency has use cases that are legitimate, then I, you know, the fact that some Yahoo out there is using it illegally is not my concern. Now, I'll agree with people who say that if, in fact, cryptocurrency is used for a lot of criminal transactions, then that might incentivize a government to crack down on crypto. I would argue that so many countries around the world are in need of capital, right? The capital that a crypto economy provides, that even if a China decides no crypto here, in India, besides no crypto here, because of the positive use cases of crypto, I believe if you're a world traveler, there will be countries, we've reached critical mass, I believe there will be countries that will gladly accept your crypto, countries in which you can legally exchange your crypto for goods and services, right? So. Green spends some time talking about how some countries are avoiding sanctions, American sanctions, by using cryptocurrency instead of their native currency. Quite frankly, I couldn't care less. Right? Again, 
as long as crypto has valid uses, and it does, right? As long as it helps improve the standard of living for many people, offers convenience, then my assumption is just like someone is gonna use a building to run a drug den or use a plane or a car to traffic in drugs, that doesn't discredit building construction or the use of planes for travel by honest people. Finally, Mike Green points out that the Bitcoin price rise is no guarantee of future success. And that's very true. He points out that JDS in 2000 was viewed as a company that had a bright future. They were gonna be one of the companies of the future. And of course, here we are 21 years later and no one remembers JDS, right? The fact that Bitcoin has been successful doesn't mean that it's gonna be successful in the future. Well, let me just say, if you're a cryptocurrency person, you've seen many cryptocurrencies come and go. Right, experienced people in the space understand the truth in this statement. Right, and so yes, I agree 100%. The fact that Bitcoin is successful today doesn't mean that it'll be successful tomorrow. I'll agree too that in the technology space, given the amount of money involved in the crypto sphere now, right, Bitcoin is up well over $50,000 a coin. There's a financial incentive for a creative group to come up with a Bitcoin rival. I'll agree with that. Right? The same could be said about any invention. Right? Quite frankly, I believe the same could be said about gold. Right? I understand gold has been around for centuries and centuries. Right? But understand, preferences change. There is an inherent risk that tomorrow is going to be different than today. So yes, I agree with Mike Green here. The Bitcoin price rise is no guarantee of future success. But let's just say it's an asymmetrical bet. Knowing that Bitcoin has limited supply, knowing that Bitcoin has been around, not for two years, but for more than a decade. Knowing that Bitcoin has achieved the networking effect. Knowing that no one has been able to double spend on Bitcoin, that the hash rate increases every day. That the Bitcoin blockchain has been operating without interruption for more than 10 years. That the technology has survived the Mt. Gox crisis, Bitcoin winters, market cycles, pandemics, right? Let's me know that the technology has more going for it, quite frankly, than just the price rise. So in sum, I'm a Bitcoin bull, but have both eyes open. I encourage people to go to realvision.com to look up the Mike Green, Anthony Pompliano debate. It is a good one. Green lays out the case. I thought Green does the better job in laying out the case, challenging basic assumptions, right, as to why Bitcoiners should proceed with caution. Just have both of your eyes open. Finally, let me just say, I personally believe that there's another existential threat to Bitcoin. Might be the biggest one. Quantum computing. I believe that's an edge risk that we all need to consider. Right? In my opinion, as quantum computers gain strength and power 
for the crypto sphere to continue on. Crypto is going to have to make itself resistant to quantum computing. Now that said, that's an edge risk in the future, right? It's something to keep an eye on, I still believe. As a speculation play here, you'd have a very hard time finding a better speculation than Bitcoin. As I've said in earlier videos, I do believe, because of the quantum computing risks, that someone should also be investing in gold and silver, right? I don't believe they're mutually exclusive. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.